Thanks very much. Okay, uh, my name is Linda C. Oh, the echo, and this is terrible. Um, my name is Linda C. I work at IASA, and this afternoon I'm going to talk about mapping land use management in Europe. Uh, lots of colleagues are involved, uh, including Giga Malik, who's going to talk after me, and the talks are, are related. Okay, I'm just going to start by introducing the LAMASIS project. So LAMASIS is a Horizon Europe project. It's actually led by IASA, not by our group, but another uh, program at IASA. And the idea is to develop an integrated modeling framework to support policy needs related to the EU Green Deal. So that's the farm to fork strategy, that's the common agricultural policy, the greening of the common agricultural policy, um, nature restoration law, etc. So lots of different policies that are all interrelated under the EU Green Deal. And then the idea of the project is that it investigates the impact of different policy options. So here again is the relation of this conference to the policy side, while gaining a better understanding of the drivers and the impacts of land use change. So it's really the land use change that's the key. And our role in the project is to develop input data sets on land use management, because these are lacking in order to support all the modeling that is taking place in LAMASIS. Okay, so the idea was not to do remote sensing. The idea was to take existing data sets that have been remotely sensed, so Korean land cover, for example, and other data sets, and to put them together to produce land use management based on you know, whatever is available at this time. Things are changing. I mean, next week, the week after, Copernicus will release a whole series of very high resolution layers that could be useful, but we had to produce layers with whatever information was available at the time. Okay, so one of the things we've done is created a branch on GeoWiki. I think GeoWiki's been mentioned. So this is an application developed in, in, in the nodes group. Uh, it's an application for visualization of land cover and land use data sets and other types of data sets on top of very high resolution imagery. So if you go to geowiki.org and you click on the, the launch GeoWiki button, you can either register quickly to get an account or you can enter as a guest. And then if you scroll down on the very top left, you can find LAMASIS Land Use Management Geodatabase. And this is where we have put all the different layers for display. We've also released data on Zenodo. OK, so we started off with uh, wanting to build a, a time series of Kareen. So you may know that Kareen is released every six years. So in 2000, 2006, 2012, 2018, but we wanted an annual time series. This is for um, some of the econometric modeling that is taking part as, uh, uh, in, in uh, LAMASIS. But we, in particular, use the accounting layers. So the accounting layers take the Kareen change layers into account. So it's not a simple case of taking the original Kareen and just subtracting to find change. It's instead using the change layers from the individual member states. That, so these changes have been digitized. And then the accounting layers are very, very stable layers. Um, and they're consistent in space and time. But what we, what we needed is to understand when the change happens. So when did the change, say, in, from arable to urban. When did that happen between 2000 and 2006? And for that, we used the um, high-resolution land cover time series produced by Open Geohub in order to determine the year of change. And then when we uh, couldn't detect the year of change, so I think maybe for 50%, we could detect the year of change using this high-resolution time series, we then used um, MODIS imagery and the BFAST algorithm to try to determine the year of change. And then whatever was left, we randomly allocated, which was about 7% of the change. Then we also had these uh, rules of transition. So you can imagine, if you are changing, say, from uh, an arable land to an urban over a six-year period, you don't do that overnight. You have some sort of transitions where you might have bare soil, you might have some construction areas. So we had rules for making these transitions between those years more logical. And then we developed this annual Korean time series. And we've put that on the uh, LAMASIS GeoWiki site. So you can see there's an example. There's all the different years. And we've also put that on Zenodo. So you can also download that. OK, so how do we then go about mapping land use management? So here again, on the GeoWiki website, you can see we've done land use management for 
2018, 2010, and 2000. And again, everything is uh, based on Kareen as the starting point. So you can see there's a whole series of different classes, uh, and now I'm going to explain how we arrived at all these different classes. So the project started with just having a look at the literature on what land use management is available, looking at land use management as mentioned in EU policies, um, compiling all the different input data sets that were available at the time and continue to be <laughs> generated, and we continue to compile those as well, and then getting inputs from modelers at IASA, as well as all the model uh, partners who are part of Lamesis. So all the major models are there. So Globium, Epic, G4M, Capri, Image, Magnet, uh, etc. So there's many, all, the, all the main modelers are part of this project. So we had a series of workshops with these modelers, and we asked them, well, what do your models need? What do your models currently do? And what do your models need in terms of land use management? And then we took this sort of preliminary set that we came up with, and we adapted it. And then we also, as part of Lamazus, have a stakeholder uh, board. It consists of about 30 stakeholders from government, NGOs, some farmers as well, and we meet annually. So we presented these sort of classes to them and also got feedback. And the whole process of, the, of deriving these classes is actually written up in one of the deliverables from the Lamasis project. So if you are interested, it's, it's on the website. OK, so here's a kind of a rough idea of the classes. They're arranged on the y-axis in terms of intensity. So everything at the bottom is sort of lower management intensity going to the very top. So if you look at forest, for example, look at forest. So we start at primary forests, so very low intensity use all the way up to very intense forestry. So this would be like short rotation uh, plantations, for example. And then the same for all the other classes. So moving from extensive farming practices to more intensive farming practices, and then on the urban side, from sort of minimal or mm, you can think of urban areas where maybe there's not much building density, there's a lot of green space up until infrastructure, and, and then these areas of the cities that are very compact, um, lots of soil sealing, not much green space. OK, so first we focus on forest management. So this was done in two stages. So this is the first version, and these are the basic classes. So we have, as I mentioned, the primary forest. You can think of also primary forest as unmanaged forest, of which there is actually very little in Europe. Um, close to nature management fo uh, forestry, then multifunctional forestry, uh, intensive forestry. So intensive forestry is like your long rotation forestry, which is really for wood production, and then your very intensive short rotation forestry. And basically, and this is the approach we've taken for all the different uh, management mapping um, products, is to have Kareen and a series of other inputs and a series of rules which allocate those inputs into these different classes. So for example, this may be a little bit hard to read, but if you have, you know, first of all, is it a forest? Then you look at the felling size, and then there was information on primary forests. This is a database produced by Sabatini. Uh, and then if the answer is yes, primary forest. And basically, we went through all these different rules. And so the disturbance, frequency, and size, that comes from a data set uh, produced by Senf and Seidel. Um, and then there is an age data set that has, uh, it was published in the past, but there's a new age data set that's been produced as part of Forest Navigator. So Forest Navigator is a kind of sister project of Lamasus. And then this is the output. So you can see it mapped. This is the first version. Um, it's at one kilometer resolution. Uh, and it's uh, been produced by um, Amsterdam, the Free University of Amsterdam. And it's available there. I know these slides will be made available. But the product and all the documentation for this product are available from that link. So you can completely download it if you're interested. However. <laughs> We realized that we actually, for Force Navigator, needed a slightly different approach. So this is version two, and it's actually a work in progress. And so one of the disadvantages of the other product is that there's no probability. So it is one class or another. OK, so we wanted a kind of more probabilistic approach. So the first thing we did is produce a forest probability layer at 100 meter. And then the other thing is we wanted a 100 meter product instead of a one kilometer product. So what we did is we took input layers 
on forest or tree cover, so the UMD Glad Forest layer, so the Hansen product, uh, the Corine product, not, so not the Corine product that we are using as the basis, but a Corine product that was produced at 10 meters, so it's um, only a few classes, but one of them is tree cover, and that was released not so long ago, the, uh, for, for 2018. Then the Copernicus Global Land uh, Cover Map and um, the JAXA Forest product. So the idea was to put all of these layers together, and it's similar to what Leandro showed us this morning. So where there's consensus, that's where you have the highest probability that it's forest, and as you have less consensus, the probability decreases. So, so that was the basis of this approach, is using this probability layer. And then, again, a series of rules. So some of, some of similarities with the other approach, so again, using the Sabatini layer, but also some data from the World, um, the world Database of Protected Areas, Intact Forest layer, and also Semfensidal updated their layer in 2024, and so if there are no disturbances, we could say that that's primary or unmanaged forest. Then we have close to nature management, in this case using, again, data from the World Database of Protected Areas and Natura 2000 sites. Then we have three different multifunctional um, forest types, so a little bit different than the previous approach. So we have protective forests. So these are the kinds of forests that would be around rivers, yeah, or at higher elevations. We have uh, a multifunctional non-woody forest product um, class, quite small, but this is things like cork trees, pine nuts. And then we have this multifunctional recreation. So we did a first allocation. By that I mean we took forest that's within 30 minutes travel time to a city, and so that, that was a recreational forest. Okay, then we um, attempted to allocate short rotation forests. So here using the JRC tree species map. So short rotation typically is things like eucalyptus, uh, robinia, uh, salix, pop, so poplar, willow. So these kinds of um, plantations where you're, you're cutting within seven to 15 years. Uh, and again, here we use the, the new semphensidal map because we were able to say, well, if there's a, uh, more than two disturbances within that 34-year period, and if it's harvest, so one of the things that semphensidal does do is it distinguishes different kinds of disturbance, and harvest is one of them. Uh, then we could say that that's short rotation. And then we have long rotation, and here we worked at, at a scale of five kilometers, and really just relying on the Hansen tree loss data because it really is actually better than the semphensidal data for this, and just looking at minimum and maximum forest losses, and if it f falls within a certain threshold, then we would say it's long rotation in combination with age data and in combination with certain tree species. And we're able to say that's long rotation. And then whatever was left, again, similar to this other approach, is multifunctional recreational forest, but we realize that the close to nature management wasn't sufficient. And some of that that went into multifunctional recreation should be close to nature management. So then we worked at a scale of 1K, and again, looking for certain forest losses, so certain sizes of forest loss and certain tree species. So that's the sort of first cut of rules. This is what the map looks like at the moment. So it's really just our first version. This is just on Google Earth Engine, so we could look at it quickly. Um, and so we're still tweaking the rules and the thresholds, uh, and that's based on the Foresters and Forest Navigator really looking at the map on top of very high-resolution imagery, realizing where maybe some of the rules are not quite right, and also calibrating with national figures. So we know, for example, how much productive forest there is in certain countries, and we can see what the map is telling us, and then we can try to, to adjust it. So that's the current um, uh, status of the forest management side of LAMASIS. Okay, then moving on to cropland management. This was actually really difficult. So when we first sat down, we thought, okay, what are all the things that tell us that something is intensive versus extensive? So irrigation, tillage practices, uh, fertilizer, so inputs to, to the land. And actually, that data is extremely hard to get spatially resolved. You might get it for one country, but to get it pan-European is really very difficult. However, I found this data set which was uh, produced by JRC, so the Capri modelers at JRC. What they did is they took a lot of data like mineral fertilizers, application of manure, so this is data that they have access to that we don't have access to. So this is agricultural survey data or something called FADN, 
which we don't have access to, but they do. That's part of being part of JRC. So they took all these layers and they created an energy layer. So obviously, the higher the energy, probably the more intensive the cultivation. So I use that layer then to come up with these classes of, say, arable intensive irrigated, arable intensive grain fed, and arable extensive, and did the same thing for permanent crops. So this is just the energy layer. It's been produced by uh, Carlo Riga. So I saw him yesterday. So this is for 2010, and I said, is there any chance you're going to repeat this for 2020 or other years? And there are plans to do it. So then we would have even more information. Right now, we're relying on this data set from 2010. And again, it's really simple rules of allocation, keeping in mind that we use Corine as the basis, and we simply take the Corine classes. And, and, and it, again, it's quite simple. So for example, if you have non-irrigated arable land, so here, for example, and then we use these energy classes to assign to arable intensive rain fed. So it's not perfect, but it was the only data set that I could find pan-European that would give us some indication of cropland management intensity. And again, the rules just apply to different Korean classes. And here it is again. So as well as putting all the management types together into a single map. We've also separated them. So under cropland management, you just have the cropland management for 2000, 2010, and 2018. And you can see the patterns. OK, grassland management. This one is actually very, very difficult. But thankfully, uh, we have Giga, who's done previously a lot of work on this, particularly in for semi-natural and natural grasslands. So it, was great to bring him on board and include him in the Lamas' project and then apply that to the other types of grassland. And so we came up with these 12 classes, so much more detailed than some of these other, um, other domains. Uh, so basically, the first four you can think of as being sort of low to very high managed pastures. And the reason we have managed pastures is because there's a pasture class in Corrine. Then we have eight to five, that's low density managed grassland to very high density. That's some of these other Corine classes. There are these um, complex or heterogeneous cropland classes. Then we have rough grazing because there is, um, there is a class in Corine that's related to these moors and heathlands. There's also an agroforestry class. So here we could say if there's livestock on, on the agroforestry, then it's silvopastoral agroforestry. And then the managed semi-natural natural, natural gland uh, grassland, which is the work that Giga had done previously. Now, what we don't have and will be appearing is something like mowing event data. So we might have it for individual countries, and it's a Copernicus product that will be appearing, but we didn't have it for developing this map. So it relies on, um, it relies on livestock density, as well as quite a complicated allocation process, which Giga may or may not talk about, um, in order to create these basic grazing maps of Europe so that we, we could use these uh, to allocate these grassland classes from Corrine. Then the other, other thing we did was, oh, I just want to say these thresholds are not arbitrary. So a lot of time has been spent with experts to see whether these uh, thresholds make sense in terms of the densities, as well as the experts looking at the spatial distribution of the final maps to make sure that they make sense. Uh, the only thing we did was separate Europe into two pieces. So there's this map of environmental strata, several different environmental strata, but just split Europe into sort of Atlantic area and Mediterranean. So there are slightly different thresholds for the Mediterranean zone. So it's exactly the same thing. We use Korean land cover as the basis, and then we use these three layers that have been produced by Giga, which is really the distribution of uh, the livestock in grazing and um, outside of grazing areas and then in the semi-natural areas, and with a, a density standardized to livestock units, and then a series of rules, which actually look a little bit complicated, but they're not really. <laughs> they're extremely simple. So for example, we could take the pasture class, and it's just, is there livestock there? Then look at the different density thresholds and determine the classes. So it's really quite a simple approach to take a Corine product, the grazing maps that Shiga has produced, and, and allocate uh, the grassland classes. And similarly, um, 
This is for the other classes in Corrine that I mentioned. So there's the agroforestry class to help us determine the difference between silvopastoral agroforestry and regular agroforestry, although agroforestry is not super well mapped in Corrine. Then we have the, the moors in Heathland um, and the, the vegetation that's uh, dry with little shrubs uh, for rough grazing. Uh, and then the, all the other natural classes. And then if there's livestock present, then it's managed uh, semi-natural, natural grassland. Okay, so that's how we allocated the grassland mapping. And again, we've put these maps on a, a separate layers on, um, on, on the Lamazus GeoWiki website, but also as combined layers. Okay, the final one then is the urban management intensity. This is actually the simplest one. So here we have five classes. So really sort of low, medium, and high intensity to do with residential buildings. Then we have the infrastructure, which of course is very high intensity, and then the other, and that's because there's a class in Kareen, which is mineral extraction and dump sites. So we put that into other. So we used, again, the Kareen urban classes. There are 11 classes in Kareen, plus the urban atlas, which is a much more detailed Copernicus product uh, with, with more detailed urban classes and then used um, the high resolution layer on soil sealing, again, another Copernicus product, to help us determine the intensity. So th this table is a bit complicated, but it, it's simply all the classes and the mapping onto the intensities. Again, quite a simple approach. Um, but, for example, for the year 2000, we don't have Urban Atlas, and Urban Atlas doesn't cover every urban area. It has to do with population thresholds. So then we used the soil sealing to differentiate between low and medium when it came to this discontinuous urban class. Okay, but that's how we, um, but that's how we created these urban intensity layers. Okay, and, and again, that's what they look like. You can see them separately on the Lamas' website or all combined together into that single uh, land use management map I showed you. Okay, so then one of the other things we had to do is to align the maps to official statistics. Okay, so the, the models all need the numbers to add up to FAO, to Eurostat, okay? And if you were just to take the Korean layers and add up the numbers, the areas don't match. They will never match. Okay, so we just use, again, a very simple approach similar to this forest um, layer. So we just created probability layers, you know, by combining all the best information that's available on grassland, cropland, and forest. And then we use those probability layers to allocate um, the amount of forest, cropland, and grassland until the numbers match the statistics, okay? And then on the right, it's just a cutoff of a table, but the whole table is in a deliverable that's online. So this is just showing, for example, for Austria, the overall accuracy before, doesn't seem that high actually, but this is based on Lucas data, and of course Lucas data is not perfect for uh, doing accuracy, but 60% accuracy, and then once we basically move the pixels around to fit the statistics, we end up with generally higher accuracies or very close numbers. Very few cases do we really end up with worse results. So sometimes grassland decreases, but, but here, for example, in, in Austria, so you are getting an increase, so grassland is actually being represented better once you fit the statistics. Okay, and then we've aggregated that for all the different models. So some models like Epic takes 1K, so then we, have produced a product that say at 1K is the shares of forest management and shares of cropland management, et cetera. So the shares of all the different management types and done the same thing for NUTS2 because some of the models uh, work only at NUTS2, some actually only work at national level. And everything is available on Zenodo. So if you were to search on the Lamas's community, you'll find all these data sets. Okay, the very last thing I'm gonna talk about, it's only a few more slides, is one of the things we wanted to, to do was to determine um, uncertainties to do with land use transitions. Okay, I'm sorry. So we started with um, a sample. This is actually a work done by my colleague Miroslav Alesov. I don't know if Miroslav is still here. Okay. So we started with a sample of 50,000 points which were distributed across Europe. Okay, so what you can see here, it's actually quite interesting. So the red is change in the, the regular Korean layers. So you can imagine you just subtract, say, 2000 and 2006, and you get change, okay? And what you get is an awful lot of change, but it's 
it, it's not real change. And you can also see the border effects, and that actually tells you something about how good these Korean products are. So there's a lot of false change in these countries. In other words, Korean is probably worse than those countries, yeah? Um, and then you can see the, the green here. These are, or, or, so blue is the change from the accounting layer only. So immediately you can see that the amount of change in the accounting layers is actually much smaller. In fact, it's a magnitude less. Um, and then you can see where there's overlap. So change is green, that, that's the places they overlap. So then again, it tells you something about the quality of the maps. Okay, so based on that, we put this into GeoWiki, okay? So we put these samples of change, and then you can see here, basically, it tells you. So th the year 2000, this was a construction site, and the year 2006, this is discontinuous urban fabric, and we asked um, a series of validators to, to, to basically validate the change. So did the change happen? And there's a whole series of ways they can answer that question in order for us to really understand if, if, if the change happened or not. Okay, so, and this was run for a subset of that 50,000 to cover all the major changes. Okay. Um, okay, so actually I'm going to skip this. I'm just going to go here because I think this is the most interesting. Okay, so once all the data were analyzed, okay, so keeping in mind, um, so each of those samples was allocated, they should have had change, okay? But What's being determined is whether they have change or not. So here, you see that actually 57.9%. <laughs> so in other words, no change occurred, but it should have occurred. Okay, so there's a huge overestimation of change in the original Korean layers, but when you go to the, the accounting layers, which use the, the change data that's been digitized by the countries, it's much better. Okay, so you're getting much better results. So you can already see that um, that you, you shouldn't use the original Korean for change, and there's a reason why they produce these accounting layers. Okay, but, and then here's the same thing by time period, and this just shows you that actually things get better as time goes on, so here the numbers are increasing. The worst was the change between 2000 and 2006, but it's quite stable in the accounting layers. And then finally, how can we use this? So this is, um, Transitions, so here we see, say, transitions between artificial surfaces and other classes in Korean. You can see how much it is if you just do a subtraction, but in reality, if you adjust it for the data that's been collected with GeoWiki, you know, you can see it's actually much less. So this is 2.3 million hectares, but in reality, it's more like 222 to 488 hectares. So really, the original Korean totally overestimates the amount of change, but when you go to the accounting layers, so this is how much, so an order of magnitude less in both cases. So this would be 11 million to change from arable land to everything else. And here arable land to everything else is 1.9 million. So it's a, an order of magnitude less. But again, when you adjust it for the data that we've collected through GeoWiki, it's still overestimated slightly. So the reality is more like 1.5 to 1.6 million hectares. And this is just one of the products that LAMAS' modelers can use. So they can see the transitions, but they can also have these uncertainties, which they can use in their modeling. And that's basically it for me. <laughs>